Hi, I'm Alana. I use they and she pronouns. And I'm Jesse. I use she and her pronouns. And, and we're, we're making mentions. Today, in the spirit of building anti-Zionist community, we're talking to the members of the Jewish Diasporas podcast, Ben, Zach, and Jordan. Hi, y'all. We're so excited to be collaborating with you. To start, just tell us some more about Jewish Diasporas and your mission. So we've been doing this for about nine, ten months. And we realized that Zach and I, when we started working together, which was around Jewish student politics in the UK, we realized that we both had a wide variety of contacts within our own different spaces, whether I grew up in California, Zach grew up in Poland, and we both found ourselves in the UK. And we realized we had all these connections to different Jewish organizations around the world, left-wing Jewish organizations around the world. And we really realize there's not a lot of people that are actually trying to uplift this other side of Jewish community that's really marginalized by our mainstream institutions and, of course, by the institutions that look at those institutions as the only voice of Jewish people around the world. So we really saw that we have these connections and asked ourselves, how could we best make use of these connections in order to actually have conversations? And Zach and I were having so many really deep conversations about Jewish politics that we realized we could actually could just have these conversations, but in a way that lets other people join us and listen to what we're learning and discussing so that we can actually have these conversations in a way that lets people think through these ideas. Because not a lot of people are talking about Jewish diaspora in the way that we have been. And we think it's really important for us to be able to start thinking about a Jewish left-wing politic that goes beyond just anti-Zionism and starts to put forward like a really holistic vision of what Jewish left-wing politics could and should be. And when it comes to our mission, it really has been to define diasporism, because if you look up the word diasporism, there is no dictionary definition of the term yet. So we really see it as something that we could play a role in starting the conversation, frankly, not starting it. It's a conversation that's been going on for 20, 30 years already. But really having the substance of thinking, what does it mean to be a diaspora? And to open that up to everyone on the Jewish left and say, this is a term that can have a lot of substance, ideological content, but it hasn't yet come into being. So we really wanted to encourage the entire Jewish left to engage with this idea of diasporism so that we can go beyond this Zionist, anti-Zionist paradigm that really, I would say, constricts Jewish politics because we have two big issues in Jewish politics. You have the issue of Zionism and then the issue of combating anti-Semitism. And often those are put, they're framed as if they're at odds with each other. You have the recent House resolution that said that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And if that's the case, then it becomes very difficult to say, I am both anti-Zionist and against anti-Semitism. So we really need to build a new framework and try to actually facilitate a paradigm shift in the way we think about Jewish politics. So that has always been our goal. We've always seen this as a organizing project, but it's also something that takes a lot of time. So we're really just focusing on the individual conversations and trying to build the connections and really listen to each other and learn from each other because so many people have so much insight into what it means to be a diasporist. And we're really just trying to provide an outlet for people to have those conversations in a public facing manner. First of all, I also wanted to say that it was Ben's idea first to go with the podcast. So credit for that goes to him. Uh, I think as well, something that was appealing to us about a podcast was that it really allowed people to express themselves in detail. It, a lot of the time these days, and I sound much older than I actually am, but uh, these days, a lot of uh, political discussions and subjects are really, you really talk about snippet of information, a uh, sn sn small amount of time. People's attention spans are quite short, especially when it comes to social media. A lot of it is incentivized to be very, to be very quick, to discuss things in a nutshell, so to speak. When you do have an hour, of course, that means that not everybody is going to listen to everything we say. But from the perspective of our guests, and that's also something we always have guests on our podcasts, that allows people to really go into detail, to have 
questions in depth that even something like a printed publication or an online publication can't do as much. And it's more inclusive, I think, because not everybody can, not everybody can write an article as well as they can just deliver a thought that is then edited. So I think it is the most inclusive way of, of really bringing in guests and offering up these new perspectives that are very needed in our communal and political organizing. Incredible. And I'm going to ask you a question that I know you have talked extensively about on your podcast, but for our listeners who have not listened to your podcast, since there isn't an easy dictionary definition for diasporism or diasporism, what does it mean? And you could go into what you're talking about with the 20 years of history behind it or for your podcast, or what does it mean today in today's conversation? Jordan, I think you have some good ideas on this. I think you're really well articulated. In sure. I just finished a master's degree in biology and ecology. And so for me, my left-wing politics goes, I think most left-wing politics goes beyond the kind of tribal borders that we construct. And so my Jewish politics might be Jewish in soul, but it isn't rigidly defined by the borders of Judaism. And I think that's where diasporism really shines. It has this ability of connecting. I, I live in Los Angeles and we're able to sympathize with the Palestinians who live in Los Angeles as well, because they're living in diaspora. And diasporism offers us this framework to approach Jewish politics through an intersectional lens that brings us to really considering what is our place in the world. We're not focused specifically on Zionism, on this mythic idea of homeland, but we're focused on our homes, where we live, in our communities. And diasporism is a Jewish politics that anchors us in, in doikite, in hereness, in the places that we grow up in, in the places that we participate in. And it's recognizing that we don't need to go somewhere else to feel at home. We don't need to center our communities on some place over there, but we can center our communities here. And those communities don't need to be defined by the borders of a religious group or the borders of an institution, but can be cross-cultural. And I think that's where Jewish diasporism, to me at least, really shines as an opportunity to go out beyond the particulars of Jewish history and try to find what can we sympathize with other people about? What is human? about diaspora what is jewish sure but also what is this movement of being dispersed from a homeland but then finding a new home in all the different communities that we build from that movement and that's what diasporism looks like for me i might also add that diasporism is both like intensely local but also global and it's really about the way we perceive of the jewish world i would say diasporism is definitely not an exclusively Jewish concept. And while we've started and mostly focused on Jewish diasporism on our podcast, we really hope to be able to, in time, really look at different other groups in terms of Armenian diasporism, Albanian diasporism, Palestinian diasporism. But diasporism in the sense that we affirm that our homeland is wherever we live is, I'd say, coming out of the Jewish experience. And that is to say, we feel that diaspora is our home in the sense that we feel connected to where we live, but also connected to all the other Jews around the world who feel the same way. And it's really about the way we conceive of the Jewish world. I like to think about it in this way, where when we think of the Zionist perception of the Jewish world, it's like a wheel where you have the axle of Israel-Palestine at the center, and then all these diaspora communities are just connected to that yet not really connected to each other. They're really connected to that center, central axle. While a diasporous perspective of the Jewish world would be like, you have a circle with all these different points along its circumference, but then rather than connecting to a central point in the middle, they're all connected to each other. They're all connected to each other such that there isn't any lines going directly through the middle, but the middle is empty. It's really about the interconnections across the Jewish diaspora that really lets us feel as if we are connected to the places we live, but also a wider Jewish world that doesn't have a single center. And I think because of that, it really lets us recognize that our Jewish identity is a global identity. And that means 
the site of struggle for Jewish left-wing politics is both connected to our own communities and winning the ideological battle that is raging under the surface of Jewish communities right now, but also connected to the wider struggle to dismantle imperialism and overcome capitalism and move towards a better future. Because we will not be free as Jews until everyone is free from these horrible systems that seek to commodify and oppress everyone. To me, I think the main point of, of diasporism is the idea that in, in the Jewish context, that Jewish cultural and communal fulfillment can reach its maximum possible level wherever Jewish communities are in the world. And it's something I feel about very personally, I feel strongly about very personally, because I grew up in an environment that is almost universally around the world considered a big uh, Jewish cemetery. Poland is considered a place where Jews used to live, but no longer do. And it's almost considered as this proof that Jewish life no longer can exist in this country, but also the general idea that the diaspora is always inherently unsafe. Uh, and you can see this in several, you can see this, for example, in how March of the Living is organized every year. March of the Living will come and visit Poland a few, uh, and see all of the concentration camps, death camps, and memorials, museums. Uh, and then a few weeks later, they'll go over to Israel and they'll see that as to celebrate Israeli Independence Day. And, they'll, and the, the, it'll be this kind of very strong paradigm. And growing up in, growing up very close to where Auschwitz was, in my little town, there was a sub camp of Auschwitz in Krakow, where I moved later on in my life. The Holocaust was everywhere. It wasn't in any sort of specific location. Its legacy existed all around us. It wasn't possible to escape. It's not possible to escape in Poland. I personally think that it is the strongest thing that we can do to honor the, the dead is to keep on living, to fight, and to say that this is our place. We have the right to be here. If people don't want to live here, in, in, if Jews don't want to live in Poland, then they should be able to leave and move wherever they want. But we have a right and we will not be pushed out. And I think that in the context of diasporism, there have been thinkers in the last 20 or 30 years, as mentioned, Melanie K. Kantrowitz, the artist, the Kitaj, who have used the term explicitly diasporist to describe their politics. There have also been several movements that can today be described as diasporist, although they didn't use that term themselves. For me personally, coming from Poland, the Jewish labor bund is one that is very close to my heart, but there are others as well. I might also add that as much as diasporism is in like an ideological perspective and a political perspective, it's also an action and activity where I see diasporism as alternative to Zionism because so much of our communities go to support Israel. Like you have the blue box thing, you have the Jewish National Fund that essentially siphons off resources from our communities to support the state of Israel. And I see diasporism as a practice, as an alternative to that, where instead of having these resources go to support the state of Israel, we could actually take these resources and actually use them far more effectively if we say, oh, we have connections to this community in Poland or in Uganda, and they need this money for XYZ, or actual example of this. In one of the episodes that my brother Jordan actually recorded with a Ugandan Jew named Sion, who is part of the Abu Yudaya community, this is a person who has spent much of the last couple of years translating the Torah into Luganda, which is the common language. And because of this, and there's a lot that could go in there, but he doesn't have the money to publish it. And this is a really important thing to allow Ugandan Jews to engage directly with the Jewish text in a language they understand. And they don't have the money to publish it. And he needs something like $7,000. And this is something that my brothers play the leading role in trying to actually fundraise for this community because he doesn't have the money to do that. And if he has that money, which isn't really that much in the grand scheme of things, he could be able to improve the spiritual character of his community by having this money to publish this and provide a Luganda translation of the Tanakh in all of the synagogues in Uganda. But it's just the much for the record, but that... Fundraiser is ongoing, and I will definitely share that with you all to leave that in the description so anyone listening, we'd really appreciate 
how bad our pouts are. Yeah, but using that as a metaphor for the wider idea of the fact that we could use the resources of our community far better to support other communities across the diaspora rather than just in Israel, which doesn't need our money. Realistically, they don't need our money at this point and arguably never really did. So it's a lot deeper to think about how can we be connected to the diaspora, not as just an abstract concept, but as a real lived ecosystem of communities that exists around the world and how can we build the connections across diaspora that lets us really be a diaspora that is by and for itself and liberating itself as the central terrain of struggle within Jewish left-wing politics. Thank you all so much for that definition and discussion. I think it's really so important and I really appreciated your point on the ways that funds in the Jewish community could be used so much better and more effectively if used by people who are not Zionists. And it, I think it it's really sad and it's really difficult to see anti-Zionist or diasporist Jews struggle to fundraise for very feasible projects that are really important and could really improve people's spiritual, communal, ritual lives. And yet, as soon as they identify outside of Zionism, that funding is nearly impossible to access. And that's a failing. That's a failing of the community. And it's really difficult. And so I think that's a, a really important point to bring up about why diasporism is so important and how we could use that to enrich cultural, spiritual, ritual lives across the globe. As Ben Kingley reminded me, about 10 years ago, there was a Yiddish radio project on Polish state radio, the, the main broadcaster, which was done to fulfill a gap that existed in the previously Hebrew section of the radio that was partially funded by the Israeli embassy. And after a few years of the project, which allowed for several people to make a living out of this broadcast, which is always very important in organizing, the Israeli embassy decided to cut funding because it was in Yiddish and not in Hebrew. And there wasn't the possibility of an alternative source of income. And thus, one of the few Yiddish radio stations in the world, in Poland, which interviewed some very interesting people, they conducted the last interview with Marek Edelman in Yiddish only two weeks before he died. That radio station was cut. That was not able to continue. I think there's a wider discussion to, to be had about how the sources of funding and philanthropy in the Jewish community exist and what are the differences between outside funding, even if it is significant in many different communities in many ways, as opposed to the community themselves being able to fundraise it on its own. That there are different mechanisms at play there. But yeah, generally speaking, there is a lot of funding, resources, time, organizing that could be redirected to more local communal efforts rather than some kind of support of the state of Israel or the status quo or whatever that may be. I think something that speaks to this reality that Israel's not interested in highlighting the diasporic nature of Judaism. Like that's not appealing to them. That doesn't help them sustain themselves. And so in that example and in countless others, they actively try to stifle examples of diasporic Judaism and contribute to wiping out diasporic culture and tradition. These languages that we have so little access to now, like Yiddish and Ladino, they're being wiped out and often that's contributed to by Israel, like in the circumstance that you're talking about. So I think it's important we highlight those as well. We wanted to ask y'all a little bit about each of your personal backgrounds and what led you to this work. I know this is a bit of a deviation. We've started to really get into the meat of it already, but I know each of you have put in a lot of individual work related to the fields, and we're really curious for you to share with our listeners a bit of those backgrounds and, yeah, what landed you doing this work today. This podcast, The Jewish Diasporans, did grow out of a passion project between Ben and Zach. Ben, for the Making Mentions listeners, is my identical twin brother. I grew up with him for most of my life. But when we were 16, he took a semester abroad in Israel. And that led him to meeting a fantastic history teacher. And that led him down a whole nother path. I guess before that, he, as well as myself, both wanted to go into environmental science or ecology. And that's where I led myself as I graduated high school and now graduated college and 
through that time, I was really interested in thinking about what is the relationship between a community and the place that it lives in. I've been over the last four years working in a plant community ecology lab. And within this lab, we think about things like coexistence, which is quantified and built upon all these levels of abstract ecological theories. But within that whole ecological context, there's still this point that this diversity that we see is what allows for the resilience of the whole ecosystem. And building on the insights as well as focusing on really straightening out my understanding of environmental history and just history as a whole through many conversations with Ben, I started to think a lot about what is the Jewish relationship to land and turning my Judaism back towards the lived relationships that I have in my own life within the relationships to people, to, to spiritual ideas, to places, to groups of people and communities. And ultimately, the last this last year, I worked on a project and what was a class at UCLA called the Ecology of Love. And the Ecology of Love was all about exploring, first of all, what is love from a philosophical and a biological standpoint. And that led me to this idea of extensive attachment, this fact that we are composed of the relationships that we build throughout our development. And that led me to really interrogating my own relationship to place which began to start getting intertwined with my relationship to the various plants all around California, living beings that we know through names and through their ecologies, but they're living side by side here with us as neighbors. And I started trying to engage with indigenous scholars and activists who are speaking of these plants as kin, as ancestors, as worthy, as rightfully belonging here. And that kind of turned back into how I thought about a Jewish relationship to place and what it means to not by right of our heritage or ancestry or mythology to have a place that is rightfully ours, quote unquote, but rather than building these relationships with people, with places, with communities and grounding those in our own experiences. And so through this whole process of engaging and thinking about my own historical community interactions with people in Los Angeles, back at my hometown in Santa Cruz, I really started trying to engage with Judaism on this spiritual ecological level. And that led me towards diasporism as a human response to the 5,000 years of history and displacement and oppression that kind of has fallen upon our species and trying to figure out how we can build an ideology of love. It's hard, maybe it's impossible to get out of ideology, but if we're intentionally engaging with our traditions, with our histories, with the philosophical and spiritual dimensions of our relationship to Judaism, I think this is what Yisrael really means to struggle with God. And doing that here in Los Angeles, in California, we can do that anywhere. And I think that's where diasporism really resonates with me. Yeah, as Jordan said, I, when I was 16, I went to Israel as a, it was this program that was called URJ Heller High. I actually got that name while I was there. And it was a lot of propaganda, just full stop, a lot of propaganda. The Jewish history course started in the Torah, went up to the Bar Kokhba revolt when Jews were expelled by the Romans. And then that who knows what happened for 1700 years. And all of a sudden we're in, we're in Germany with Herzl. And it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> so there was a lot of unlearning that happened after that program. And a lot of the, several of the people that I was in Israel with during that time, and I used the word Israel very intentionally because I was not thinking about it as anything other than Israel at the time. Several of the people that were on that program with me, I've been in touch with and have also gone down the same unlearning pro rabbit hole and really realized, oh my God, what did they teach us? But in a lot of hindsight and re-reflecting on what that, why I went on that program and what I learned from it, I was really searching for the roots of my Jewishness. So much of growing up as a Jew in diaspora is this question of like, where am I from? Who am I? I think this is a universal question, but I think for Jews, it's especially, especially poignant because beyond a few generations, like we don't know. Like I could tell you in the last couple of years, actually, especially with Zach in the last year, I have actually been really trying to find out, like, where am I from? What does this mean to be a Jew 
specifically an Ashkenazi Jew. Growing up, I was told that I had Russian Jewish ancestry, but I quickly realized, no, I, Russia, what is Russia? In the 19, before 1914, Russia included Poland, Russia included Belarus, Ukraine. All of my ancestry comes from the so-called Pale of Settlement. And in the last year, I actually went to Poland with Zach in April. And that was a really eye-opening experience because when I was in Israel in 2017, we went to Poland for a week and it was this very typical trip focused solely on Jewish death. And because of that, I really wanted this last trip that I went on about seven or eight months ago. The intention was to focus on Jewish life. And we really did that. And we went all over the country. We were there specifically for the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And we met some really cool people while we were there. And I was surrounded by more Yiddish speakers than I ever have in my entire life. And that was a really profound experience where I actually felt, I felt what had been taken from me for the first time, I think. I realized this is a place my ancestors, like my great-grandfather, grew up. And this is a language that I find incredibly beautiful. But I've never really been able to feel as if it's something that is still here with us, that we can actually just reach out and grab. And that was a really profound experience because we spent a day in the east of Poland because my great-grandfather, he, one of my great-grandfathers, he came from this small town called Radimno, which he called Redham. And the town of Radimno is still there. And he left in 1928. But we visited the town. And I had a picture of the house that he grew up in from the 90s, from when my great aunt or something visited the town and found the house. And we had a old street address and we had a picture of the house. And we went to this town, couldn't find the street. So we were like, okay, what can we do? Zach and I went to the town records office. Really grateful to have Zach with me because I speak no Polish and they spoke no English. But we went to the town records office, found someone, we we're like, hey, Here's a picture of this house that my great-grandfather grew up in. It was called, on the street, called Rusko Elitsa, which is Russia Street. And very obviously, it does not by the name Russia Street anymore. So we're asking, what is the street name now? And they were able to point us to it. The house still stands. We walked 150, 200 meters, and there it was. And I can send you a picture of it. But I just sat there in front of the town, in front of this house that was old wooden house, not a big house. Looked like, I don't think anyone was living there. It was decaying. Looks like it couldn't be there for, it could go away in the next couple decades. But it was really incredible to be able to actually sit in front of this house that my grandfather lived in. 95 years ago is when he left. So it's a long time. When he left, I don't know if he really thought he was going to come back. It's really hard to tell because a lot of times we frame it as if they left and they never intended to have any sort of relationship to that place ever again. But that's just not the truth. A lot of people did go back to visit. And this is a house that, frankly, I was surprised is still standing. It survives two world wars on the border between Poland and Ukraine, and it's still standing. And I was touching the soil that he played on. And it was this feeling that, I can say this from personal experience, when you grow up as a Zionist, you placebo yourself to feel something when you go to Israel, because it's like, oh, this is my homeland. This is like, my ancient roots, and you're feeling it because you're told that you're supposed to feel it. So you force yourself to feel it. But this is where my great-grandfather grew up with. He played in this 95 years ago. There I was sitting on that same soil. And that was a really profound experience because it really helped me start to wrestle with the question of where am I from in a way that's not abstract at all, but it's very much concrete. And the fact is, in that moment, I was like, it would be incredible to be able to buy this house and turn it into a museum of local Jewish life. And unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be able to happen because I speak no Polish and it's in a part of Poland that is incredibly right wing. So it would not be very safe to do that realistically. But it's just the fact that's something that could be done. And that's something that I think, frankly, should be done if we had the people and if we had the resources to make that happen. It's the sort of thing that really shows that Jews have lived all over the world. And we shouldn't just write off this history. And the last year I was doing a master's in modern history. And I wasn't intending for it to be focused solely on the history of the Jewish left, but it ended up being a history of the Jewish left from like the 1880s to 1920s. And I was decentering Zionism by focusing on diasporism. And they weren't using the term diasporism, but by identifying diasporism as a practice, as the choice to live 
Jewish life, where you are living, wherever you're living. It really helped me understand just that this is something that people have wrestled with for a long time, even if they weren't naming it. The fact that you can build Jewish community anywhere and have it be rooted where you are in a way that, frankly, has nothing to do with Zionism. It's more about actually living in community with your people, with the people around you. And that's not just Jews, but that is often with many other Jews. And it's about recognizing that we have a history as diaspora and recognizing how much of that has been lost, not just by people, not just by people forgetting, but by an intentional forgetting, by the intentional choice to write out this history and solely understand it through a Zionist, anti-Zionist framework. And frankly, these people that went from Eastern Europe to the U.S. mostly, there were 2.7 million people that went between 1880 and 1914 to the U.S. from Eastern Europe. They weren't thinking about Zionism. The vast majority of them just wanted to live safely. And they saw in the U.S. a possibility for that. And there's a lot you could go into in terms of the relationship of, with whiteness. But the fact is, I found so much meaning by recognizing that this is something that all people should have the right the right to be able to leave and build a new home wherever the hell they want to. And this is something that my great-grandfathers, my great-grandparents all were able to do. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people have lost that right because of the construction of border regimes that for a huge portion of it, especially in England, explicitly in England, they set up border controls exclusively to prevent the, the arrival of more Jewish immigrants. And it's about recognizing that's our history. And the lesson we need to learn is that we need to have free immigration. People have a right to live wherever they want to live. And it's about the universal character that we get from our history as Jewish diasporas. For anyone who is interested in trying to discover some part of their family history in Poland today, this goes out to all of you here and to any potential listeners. I'll be very happy to help just from being in Poland and understanding the language. So my father's family came to the UK from the Russian Empire, from different areas, central Poland today, Belarus, Latvia. And they also managed to come in a few years before the immigration controls, the Aliens Act that was introduced by Arthur Balfour, of course, the great friend of the Jews, Balfour. And specifically to prevent more Jewish immigrants from coming to? Almost all of my family that, that stayed in Eastern Europe from that side was wiped out during the war, with a few exceptions. A very long distant cousin was able to escape a few days before the Nazis entered the capital of Latvia. And she ended up in Kyrgyzstan, came back after the war and had a child in 1946. And we met that person when I traveled into Latvia in 2017. I remember, especially for my dad, it being very meaningful. He always grew up thinking that everyone who stayed behind died. And then over 70, he was able to travel for the first time to Latvia and actually meet someone physically. See, the only synagogue that remains in the town in Eastern Latvia, where our family came from, that still stands. My mother's side of the family is not Jewish. They're actually from a region of Poland called Silesia, which is the coal mining region. Think of it as, I don't know, West Virginia of Poland. And also one of the few places in Poland today that still maintains a kind of local ethnic national minority. And both my parents met in Paris, and that's where I was born. So I always grew up in a very mixed environment, and I could have gone down very many different roads there. When I was five, I moved to Poland. And for the longest time, the only Jewish person that I knew growing up was my dad. So it was quite obvious for me that any sort of connection with that would be largely framed through his experiences and where he grew up. He grew up in East London. And when he was in his early 20s, he was living in Geneva and the Six Day War broke out. He never grew up as a Zionist. So to speak, it wasn't a big part of his identity, but he felt at the time that a Jewish community was under threat. There was this idea that NASA was going to drive the Jews into the sea. And he decided to go to the Israeli consulate in Geneva. 
and just said he wants to go, he wants to sign up. And apparently his boss was totally okay with that. And the next day he was on a plane to Israel. He stayed there for a few months on a kibbutz as a farmhand, while a lot of the other people from the kibbutz were in the army. And the way that he relates it now is a very interesting experience. Because first of all, at the time, he felt that there was a very strong semblance of victory. And not just victory, the fact that it's over. It's going to be over. We will retreat from the occupied territories and we will have peace in return. That's the relation that he had with that. He also managed to meet uh, several Egyptian officers. They were in a POW camp next to the kibbutz near Haifa. And they would go there from the kibbutz and toss them cigarettes over the fence and just have a chat. And the Egyptian officers themselves felt that this war is pointless. Why are we fighting? And so on. And only after a few months there, he became more disillusioned. He saw that it's not that it's not over. There's still something going on. And one thing that also he said more recently to me about that experience was that he didn't find Israel as someone who grew up in the Jewish quarters of East London. He didn't find it very Jewish, despite the fact that he was surrounded by Jewish people most of the time. He didn't find it as a particularly Jewish cultural place. It wasn't the kind of thing that he was connected with. And so he left. And for the longest time, he said that he will not go back until the occupation ends. And he kept that promise for, for quite a long time. He eventually did travel to Israel. I went there when I was 12. But in the meantime, he became involved in several different organizing groups, including the Jewish Socialist Group, opposition to the war in Lebanon, and so on. He didn't tell me too much about this when I was growing up. But if, as this was the only real sort of Jewish communal experience that I had, I did eventually become more involved in a Jewish community, and I did have a reform conversion. A Bet Din came from London, and I had the first local reform bar mitzvah in Krakow since the 1940s. To be fair, there was a bat mitzvah the year before. Nevertheless, I wasn't really surrounded in that sort of mainstream communal environment. And I didn't feel a lot of the pressures that come from those kinds of environments had. I really had the possibility of discovering Jewishness on my own. That wasn't something that I had a lot of possibilities to do apart from just having conversations with my dad about it. And so through that, I became more acquainted with, with Yiddish. He became a, a Yiddish teacher for a while. He's a translator officially. And then on my own, I started becoming more and more involved in looking up progressive politics. I was very inspired by... Bernie Sanders's first presidential campaign. I remember staying up uh, and watching the, I think it was like the West Virginia or Kentucky Democratic primary as a 14 year old on a Tuesday night, even though I've never been to America. But still, something about Bernie's a very positive message of healthcare, education, minimum wage that was the start of it for me before any sort of Polish or British or Jewish politics became involved with that. And then later on, I had a teacher at my high school, which was, I went to the British school in Krakow. And that allowed me to explore more and, and do more research on politics regarding Israel-Palestine, which before were just not really present. I remember being 16 or 17 and just saying, I don't want to focus on it because I don't think that I can do it in an unbiased way. That was like way down the road. I knew something was there, something was not right, but it wasn't a real area of focus. And then when I was 18, I actually had the possibility to go on a trip to, to Israel and the West Bank. And I traveled to Nazareth, Nablus, Janine, Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem. And it just really, it awakened some, something in me. Like the conditions that I saw that I really felt were not right, that there's something seriously wrong with the status quo. And just so through that, with reading up certain authors, Michael Svard, Ilan Pape, Rashid Khalidi, Ben White, and Raja Shahada, it became something that I was more strongly associated with. When I started studying in the UK, I had for the first time the possibility of being in a Jewish community of my peers. And though, especially in the beginning, a lot of that was framed through me being involved in Palestine solidarity politics. I never treated Palestine solidarity politics or anti-Zionism as the only main point of my Jewish identity. I always treated it as a set of policies rather than an ideology in and of, in of itself. And 
as I became strongly interested in being involved in the local Jewish community, I had that incentive from not having that back home and coming from a very small communal environment. I started thinking, what is a comprehensive set of policies of a progressive politics that can be applied to the Jewish community in Britain, in Poland, and around the world? And that led me to gravitate towards really investigating ideas of, of Bundism and diasporism. We, we've all been bleeding our hearts out about how important all these events for us in, in our life are. But in, in bottom line is, I think all of us have very important background histories that inform the politics that we are doing and the kind of world that we are trying to create. Thank you all so much for really going in depth into your backgrounds and how they brought you here. For anybody listening who's like, wait, that was so interesting. This is not our last episode with Ben Jordan and Zach, and we will be able to get into more in-depth conversations about everything they're bringing up. For Jordan and Ben, I can see some of my own story in what you're sharing about the disillusionment or being caught up in Jewish institutions, projecting a narrative about Zionism onto you. And for Alana and I, that led us to identify very staunchly as anti-Zionist and making mentions of the anti-Zionist org. And I think we're curious, coming from the diasporist perspective, if diasporism is similar to anti-Zionism in your view, or if it isn't exactly the same, what are some of the, of the differences that you identify? Yeah, I can go into that a little bit. When I was 18 in my freshman year of my undergrad, I saw myself as a socialist, but at the same time, I saw myself as a little bit like a labor Zionist because I was still at that point in my life. And a friend of mine called me out. It was at like a party and she called me out for having cognitive dissonance and holding those two positions. And that started me down like a real reassessment of my, the way I relate to my Jewish politics. And it took a long time to do that, unlearn, learn. And I was in my undergrad for history, so I was doing just not focusing on Jewish history. I was focusing on world history and the history of the global South and imperialism, because that's really where my interests lie. And, but my senior year, I came back to Jewish politics. It was I was doing a Jewish studies minor. And for my final project for that minor, I ended up writing, it was an independent study. And I wrote about the theory and practice of Zionism over, frankly, since Herzl and focusing, trying to find the roots of a progressive post-Zionism within that history. And I learned about Bundism as like the only real anti-Zionist position I included within there. But I was also looking a lot at the dialogue between within the Zionist left, because you do have multiple strands within that often get lumped into labor Zionism. But like you do have the early Borachovists, the Marxist Zionists, that did not see the end goal as the creation of a Jewish state. They saw that they only wanted to have a place of refuge, and frankly, as part of the diaspora of Jewish people within Palestine. They didn't see this as replacing diaspora, but as a part of it. And I think this last year, I was realizing that trying to find the roots of a progressive post-Zionism within the history of Zionism, is a, it's silly to do that because it's not Zionism that we're talking about. So this last year, I was focusing on diasporism, and in doing that, I really stopped using the Zionist anti-Zionist paradigm and started using a diasporist anti-diasporist paradigm, because not all early Zionists especially were anti-diasporist. This idea of negation of diaspora as Israel will replace diaspora. We need to ingather all the exiles. And frankly, I, I reject the notion that diaspora is exile because I do not feel in exile where I live. I feel like I'm at home where I live. And because of that, with that history, I learned that anti-Zionism is a position. And I don't see diasporism solely as anti-Zionism because I think it's bigger and it's, it's not about centering Zionism at all. So I think you do have some diasporists who are anti-Zionists. You have some diasporists who are non-Zionists. And weirdly enough, at one of the bigger rabbinical colleges in the UK, I learned that the entire class identified as diasporist. And that meant that there was some cognitive dissonance where someone was actually identifying as both a diasporist and a Zionist. So I do think when it comes to understanding diasporism as opposed to anti-Zionism, to me, it makes a lot of sense. Anti-Zionism is part of diasporism. It's a position within it that recognizes that we need to reject this idea that Zionism is 
the centerpiece of Jewish life. And it's about decentering that entirely in the way we understand our Jewish politics. And because of that, I think when we are thinking about like providing the substance of diasporism, we do need to be very explicit that it is the other side. If like we want to go beyond a Zionism, anti-Zionism paradigm, we need to go to a Zionism, diasporism paradigm that does see diasporism as contrasting directly, in direct contradiction to Zionism. But it's also, it's not explicitly just anti-Zionist. It can be non-Zionist. And that, I think, does lead to some political disagreements with some people on the Jewish left who are identifying more strongly and closely to anti-Zionism. But I think it's also important if we really are serious about wanting to win the struggle within our communities to open up the tent to what it looks like. And you do have some people that might try to say that Zionism and diasporism are not in direct contradiction, but I would say that they definitely are. It's about the way we conceive of our community as a world community, as the world Jewish, as the Jewish world and how we conceive of it in a way that is entirely separate from Zionism, that is actually grounded where we live and connected to the wider Jewish world. The way I understand anti-Zionism in relation to diasporism is how I understand anti-capitalism and socialism. It's easy to recognize what you dislike. It's harder to put forward a platform of what you stand for. And why we take a diaspora stance is to get out of this trap of being solely against things and rather to affirm Jewish life in diaspora. And I, I think that's the simplest way to put it. I think that this separation between anti-Zionism as a political viewpoint or a view on a specific issue and anti-Zionism as the general ideology that is connected to Jewish politics are very different and they have very different implications. Because frankly speaking, I think that if you have, if you have people or an organization uh, that are very critical of of Israel in whether it be anti-occupation, anti-apartheid, anti-Zionism, whatever. If they are only focusing on that, if that is the only thing that their politics turn around, they can end up reinforcing the idea that Zionism is the centrality of of Jewish life, that all Jewish discourse has to go around it. And if people want to engage in that kind of politics, I think that's completely fine. I also think that when it comes to a Jewish framework of Jewish left politics, it's quite shallow. It doesn't verge on discussions of what Jewish communities, how Jewish communities should be structured. What does it mean to have Jewish leadership? What is Jewish culture? How do we guarantee security in diaspora? What about what are, how are Jewish communities structured in an urban or rural landscape? These are all very interesting questions. And just labeling Jewish politics as anti-Zionist, it, it doesn't tell you anything about it. It doesn't see any sort of importance to them. And I think we do as well is a reaction to some tendencies that I've seen in some Jewish left organizations that do very much focus only on Israel-Palestine stuff, but they use the language and aesthetics of something like the Jewish labor bund, the very famous symbol with the hands and the idea of wherever we live, that's our homeland, or we support Deutschkeit, stuff like that. But then they don't engage in it. They don't see that as part of their politics. And again, I think it's a narrow focus, and I think we want to do more than that. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing, in that the way I see anti-Zionism is anti-Zionism, first and foremost, is about liberating the Palestinian homeland or li liberating Palestine. And when it comes to the question of Jewish left politics and Jewish liberation, you do, have, you do have some Zionists that say that Zionism is the liberation movement of the Jewish people. And that's just so silly because I don't feel liberated and one people's liberation cannot come at the expense of another. But when it comes down to separating diasporism or making the distinction between diasporism and anti-Zionism, it's about the terrain of struggle. Whether we see the terrain of struggle in Jewish politics solely around Israel-Palestine or if we're centering the terrain of struggle in our own communities where we live and recognizing that we have to win that battle. And frankly, that's our job as Jews in diaspora because we're not going to be we're not going to be liberating Palestine. We have a role in that struggle, but it's not it's not our struggle alone. We have to be allies. We should be in coalition with Palestinians in that struggle. But I also think it's important that in coalition with Palestinians, frankly, our goal, at least in my head, it's always been about socialist internationalism, of course. 
But our goal within that, the idea would be to create a Jewish section of a socialist international that can organize the Jewish diaspora to fight for our own liberation alongside the Palestinians and their fight for their liberation. And this is tied to a broader politics of social reconstruction and social transformation. But it's recognizing that the terrain of struggle for us as Jewish leftists is our own communities first and foremost. And that, of course, is connected to the struggle for Palestinian liberation. And they, frankly, Zionism also dehumanizes Jews within Israel-Palestine. And we need to recognize that we need to think about what it would look like to transform the Jewish community in Israel-Palestine from a Zionist community to a diasporist community. That is making it so that it's not the end-all be-all of the Jewish world, but is part of the Jewish world while also, frankly, we have so much work to do to even remotely think about that, considering how fascist the country is and the electorate is. But thinking about what it would look like to have a Jewish world that is for itself, but also for the liberation of all humanity. And it's about recentering the terrain of struggle into our own communities, as opposed to anti-Zionism that sees the terrain of struggle solely within Israel-Palestine. And just to finish off, diasporism is able to provide an alternative when we do see in our communities, just in dialogue, I speak to a lot of people in the more mainstream communal environments, that people are very critical of a lot of stuff relating to the Israeli government. And a lot of the response is just, I don't see an alternative. So we have to provide that alternative a positive alternative. Thanks, y'all. I have a lot of thoughts on a lot of things that you all said that I don't know if we have time to get into. Can I throw one thing out there? But I think the definition of anti-Zionism is very interesting to different groups. And I think the narrowness of some interpretations of anti-Zionism are like anti the modern state of Israel and the concept that Jews need a homeland because of the Holocaust or because of pogroms or because of that's one way to read anti-Zionism. I think what a lot of people are trying to do now is like anti-Zionism as a framework for understanding the world, which does lead to diasporism. But I think specifically, sometimes it can be important to have that negative stance in order to interrupt and to push back because sometimes only positive alternative create the notion that we don't have to fight back against something we just create our own thing that's separate and that can actually alienate or leave the people that we're trying to create coalitions with on their own i think there is room for both ideologies right now in this podcast episode where we're just going to leave this for now and bring it back up when we we come back together but i just wanted to throw that out there that i think it depends how we're defining anti-Zionism. But Alana, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, I think there's, of course, so much to get into there. And hopefully when we flip this collaboration on its head and it's making mentions on the Jewish Diaspora's podcast, we can continue some of that conversation. Because yeah, I'm also curious to hear, like, do any of you feel like you identify both as anti-Zionist and diasporous Jews? It, is it one or the other? Or is it a both and? And yeah, I'm seeing Ben and Jordan shaking their head. Yeah, no, I think it's important to recognize that I, when we say that we see anti-Zionism as a position, we also think that position can fully be part of diasporism. And it's more of recognizing that there are diasporists who are more non-Zionist, and there is certainly conflict within that. And when it comes to understanding diasporism as on its own terms, it's more about recognizing that it doesn't have to have anything to do with Zionism. But of course, when we put Zionism versus diasporism as a paradigm, we do see it as necessarily in conflict with it, with uh, Zionism. Totally. Yeah, there, there is so much nuance in our movements, and we're excited to, to keep talking about some of it, some of the things that I want to highlight for folks that I think we'd love to talk about in our next episode to look forward to or talking about Ashka normativity and how diasporism can challenge that and maybe some of the history of Jewish diasporism and how long it's been around and dreams that Jewish Diasporist podcast has for themselves. So we're excited to talk more about some of that. Thank you all for joining us, Ben, Jordan, and Zach. Truly, it's been such a pleasure collaborating and learning from you all. And thank you everyone for listening. So stay tuned for those future episodes in collaboration. I want to highlight for Making Mentions listeners that we have generally been on a hiatus since October 7th to devote our time and energy towards organizing for Palestinian liberation. And so our podcasts have been coming out less frequently because 
our heart and soul and mind and body and organizing spirit are elsewhere right now. But we are excited to hopefully bring more content to y'all with this episode and in the coming weeks as we continue that struggle. So thanks y'all for listening with us. Thank you so much for having us. It's been really such an honor and pleasure working with you guys. Thank you very much. 